Welcome again and good evening. My name is Amy. I'm the Public Programs Manager at the New York Transit Museum. And I am very pleased to introduce Polly, the museum's content manager. <clears throat> She'll be talking today about the construction of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel and how it affected surrounding communities, including Little Syria. So a couple of things before we start, we've enabled closed captioning. So to turn them on, you go to captions at the bottom of your window. If you don't see that, click the three dots and click captions and then show captions. And if you have any questions during the program, please feel free to put them in the chat and then I'll relay the questions to Polly during time at the end. Doctor, okay. Polly, is that you? That is not me, Amy. All right, I'll, I'll investigate that soon. Sorry guys, let me okay. get the rest of this. Okay, so if you haven't been to the museum, you should come. It's a very cool place. We are in a downtown Brook, uh, in downtown Brooklyn, a decommissioned IND subway station. And right now we are open Thursday to Sunday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And you can reserve tickets on our website or show up at the door. So now I'll hand it over to Polly. Thanks so much, Amy. And um, good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for um, spending a little time with us. Um, this evening, and uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation, and I'll see you on the other side. So, it is undoubtedly true that New York City and the region is the way it is because of the mass transit system that helped create it, and particularly the complex road, rail, and bus systems that continue to sustain it today moving literally millions on a daily basis from communities spread over a 5,000 square mile territory, these networks have allowed the region to grow and flourish, and they provide a lifeline for people to be able to live and work in the five boroughs and beyond. As a price for progress and growth, as well as helping to create neighborhoods, mass transit has had negative impacts on some communities, altering both the landscape and the feel and culture of the city. The infrastructure needed to move millions of people takes up a great deal of space and successive waves of development have overturned people's lives and whole neighborhoods have been raised for all of this progress to occur. Today, we're gonna to take a closer look at one such transit infrastructure project, the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, which of course is now called the Hugh L. Carey Tunnel, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna use the uh, original name. Um, and this tunnel demolished a neighborhood in Manhattan known as Little Syria and helped to cut off another in Brooklyn called Red Hook. But both despite and because of mass transit, the impacted communities survived as they adapted to the ever-changing city around them. So let's begin our story at the tip of Manhattan where the city gazes on the harbor and Lady Liberty. This is the community that was most impacted by the building of the tunnel. So we're gonna explore it a little. So from the mid 1800s to the 1920s, many immigrants arrived on these shores from countries like Ireland, Poland, Greece, Slovakia, and what was known then as Greater Syria, which today includes Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Israel, and the Palestinian territories. They settled where they first set foot in Manhattan at Battery Park and moved into the tenement buildings along Greenwich Street and Washington Streets that ran north from uh, Battery Place. So because of the concentration of Syrian homes and businesses on Washington Street, but also scattered throughout the neighborhood, the community in the 1890s became known as Little Syria, or uh, sometimes referred to as the Syrian colony. And it became the center of Arabic culture in the United States. Not only were there import businesses selling all kinds of exotic merchandise, and restaurants, bakeries, doctors, and lawyers. It was also the birthplace of the first Arabic language newspapers in the United States, like Al Hoda that you can see on the screen. Um, and so for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna to refer to these specific immigrants as Syrian, even though they may not have been exactly what we understand as Syrian today. So it was a it was a tight knit and multicultural community. 
residents had their issues at times, of course, but most just got on with the business of living. It was not unlike many immigrant neighborhoods in the city. Buildings were old and often run down, having had successive waves of previous immigrants pass through before moving on to greener pastures and, and families, you know, were often crowded together. Um, a couple of these images from the Library of Congress um, really show life on the streets of Little Syria. Um, and you can see an elevated train station in the distant background of the food cart image. Um, the age and the quality of, of some of the buildings. And I like the man in the traditional fez. Um, he's pouring out some kind of drink for thirsty customers and perhaps he's in Battery Park. So one view into the Syrian colony back then comes from um, a novel called The Book of Khalid, um, which was written in 1911 by author Amin Rihani, and he described living in a Syrian con colony like this. We rented a cellar as deep and dark and damp as could be found. In the front part of this cellar, we had our shop. In the rear, our home. On the floor, we laid our mattress, mattresses. On the shelves, our goods. And never did we stop to think who in this case was better off. The safety of our merchandise before our own. But 10 days after we had settled down, the water issued forth from the floor and inundated our shop and home. It rose so high that it destroyed half of our capital stock and almost all our furniture. And yet we continued to live in the cellar because perhaps every one of our compatriot merchants did so. So clearly flooding was one of the problems um, that people faced in the neighborhood and it was probably worse on Washington Street because that was a little closer to the river um, but of course people just adapted and they made do with what they had. As time went on despite challenges of all kinds residents became attached to their rather unique downtown home. And according to the authors of the book, The Financial District's Lost Neighborhood, 1900 to 1970, who themselves, are, I believe, are descendants of families that lived in the neighborhood, um, they said by the 30s and 1940s, unlike many residents of tenement neighborhoods, these people did not want to leave the place they called their village. Although the apartments were small, the bathrooms were in the halls and sometimes in the yard, the bathtubs were in the kitchen, and coal stoves were used to heat the apartments, they enjoyed their life in Lower Manhattan. Research shows, of course, however, that living conditions in the colony prompted many Syrian immigrants to start moving, uh, particularly to Brooklyn, even before the turn of the century, um, looking to get away from the overcrowded tenements in the neighborhood. Most of the Syrian immigrants who came in the early days, in the 1890s, were Christian, though there were Muslims among them too. Churches were established, which became social as well as spiritual centers of the community, including St. Joseph's Maronite Church, uh, which was on Washington Street, uh, demolished because of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, um, St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church on Cedar Street, and St. George's Syrian Catholic Church at 103 Washington Street. So St. Nicholas Church survived both the construction of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel and the World Trade Center in the 1960s, but sadly um, it was destroyed in the September 11th um, attacks. However, it was recently rebuilt at a site nearby on Liberty Street, um, which is just such a wonderful beacon of light um, in this neighborhood. It's really uh, worth a, a visit if you can get down there. Um, St. George's still stands today, but um, it's no longer a church. Um, it was a restaurant at one point. I'm not sure if it's still a restaurant, um, but this building is really one of the last remnants of the, of the Syrian quarter to have survived. Um, and the building was landmark in 2009. 
um, Public School 29 that you can see right there in the center, um, which stood at Washington and Albany streets until the 1960s, served uh, most of the children in the community. Um, but uh, there, some of the kids went to um, St. Peter's School, which was attached to St. Peter's Catholic Church on Barclay Street, um, the oldest actually of its kind in the whole country. Schools in the community, of course, eventually all closed because of low enrollment in the years following the opening of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. There just weren't uh, kids living there anymore. Uh, Battery Park, which is right at the tip of Manhattan Island, uh, provided respite for the residents of this downtown community. And it really was a cherished resource and rare sort of open space. It was home of the first New York Aquarium, which was housed inside um, historic Castle Garden. Um, the authors I mentioned uh, earlier reported that a, a typical Sunday afternoon for downtown residents included going to Battery Park to sit with family and friends. And literally some people arranged the park benches by the village or the community that they came from. Um, I think that's rather lovely. The Ninth Avenue elevated line, the very first of its kind in New York City, wound its way through Battery Park from the South Ferry Terminal, which was a real uh, transportation hub. And it wound up Greenwich Street, heading north over Ninth Avenue, eventually reaching 155th Street um, several years later. The Manhattan Railway Company also operated the Sixth Avenue elevated line, which split from the 9th Avenue L at Morris Street in the heart of Little Syria as it headed up Trinity Place. And you could also pick up the 3rd Avenue L at the South Ferry Terminal, as well as ferries to Brooklyn and Staten Island. Um, so pretty, pretty good for transportation. In addition, of course, there were surface and street um, traffic. Uh, there were horse cars, and then electric streetcars running on tracks along the battery um, and along West Street, carrying people and goods up the west side um, to all of the piers uh, that lined the river. In the background of the battery um, place image uh, with our horses, uh, you can see the battery place elevated uh, train station right on the corner of Greenwich Street and the horse car, I love it, thundering along in the foreground. Now, according to um, author Linda K. Jacobs, um, the Manhattan Railway Company um, only employed two um, Syrian men from the neighborhood. Uh, apparently one started um, as a blacksmith, but he ended up uh, working as a conductor on the L's. Uh, the other was employed as a guard, but he left the company apparently to become a dry goods merchant because I bet he made a lot more money as a dry goods merchant. Eventually, um, the subway would make it this far south, adding to the abundance of public transportation options nearby. So this was a real boon to the residents and, of course, especially the businesses um, around this neighborhood uh, as office workers you know, began commuting in and out of the city to all these big buildings. So like many immigrant communities at this time, uh, the Syrian community was full of people trying to improve their lives and the lives of their families. This meant working hard to get uh, better housing, decent schools and good business opportunities. They used what was around them to their advantage and being able to travel throughout the city and beyond using public tra transportation was a crucial resource. So before 1883, the only way to travel between Manhattan and Brooklyn and Long Island was by boat, of course. Ferry services between the two islands date back to the 17th century. However, by the time most Syrians began arriving, the Brooklyn Bridge was open and the Williamsburg Bridge uh, was on its way. The South Ferry service that you can see on this um, map linking the battery with the foot of Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, which the neighborhood was known then as South Ferry itself. Uh, this was an important public service for the residents of Little Syria, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, 
Uh, the Hamilton Avenue Ferry, not far away, was another important ferry service linking Lower Manhattan to South Brooklyn. As early as the 1890s, Syrian immigrants were seeking out better living conditions across the river. In Brooklyn, they found a bit more space and light and eventually opportunities to establish businesses of their own. Author Linda K. Jacobs, again, in her meticulously researched book, Strangers in the West, emphasizes the importance of the ferry between the two neighborhoods at the turn of the century. She said the ferry cost one cent between seven and nine in the morning, two cents thereafter. To take a push cart on the ferry cost, cost one and a half cents. It's estimated that the Brooklyn Ferry Company, which ran routes across the East River, carried 125,000 foot passengers a day. We know of no Syrian owned businesses in South Ferry, Brooklyn in 1900, but given the number of Syrians living there, it would seem likely that some small shops had already sprung up. Still, nearly everyone in the community took the ferry every morning. So the ferry allowed the community to expand, but stay connected to the mother colony, to jobs and stores and restaurants and family and friends. So we're gonna come back to the um, settlement on Atlantic Avenue uh, a little later on. Not too far from Atlantic Avenue, along Columbia Street um, in Brooklyn, you reach Hamilton Avenue. Now, once this was the site of another ferry service connecting Lower Manhattan with Brooklyn. Specifically, when the ferry began in the 1840s, it provided a direct route to Brooklyn's famous Greenwood Cemetery. And when you weren't attending a funeral or burying somebody yourself, a trip to Greenwood was like having a lovely day out in the country. Um, it still is, by the way. Um, and this was the easiest way to get there. Eventually, of course, it became a busy commuting route for many New Yorkers in and out of, of Lower Manhattan. Ferry service at Hamilton Avenue lasted a full century um, until 1942. Uh, where the ferry house once stood that you can see in the photograph uh, is now a parking lot. Ridership actually was decimated by the building of the East River bridges and, of course, the trolley and the subway lines that sprang up, as well as the construction of major highways, the Gowanus Expressway, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway and the approaches to the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. In the years after ferry service ended and infrastructure for cars took over, this end of Hamilton Avenue lost all the people that actually used to uh, live there. A recent, fairly recent study of the area noted that this may be the only neighborhood in New York where industrial usage replaced residences, restaurants, hotels, and retail, as opposed to the opposite trend uh, we see in the former industrial zones, such as Chelsea, Williamsburg, and Soho. And of course, I would add, you know, like places like Long Island City. So the opposite happened in this neighborhood. The construction of these major roadways and the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel required demolition, of course, and the clearing of residences and other buildings. Now, these slashes into the landscape separated a once connected community known as South Brooklyn. Uh, Carroll Gardens, the Columbia Waterfront District and Gowanus are on one side and Red Hook is on the other. Red Hook, a neighborhood that is surrounded by water, as you can see there on the map, was a really busy and important shipping port by the 1920s, catering to the pretty transient population of sailors coming and going. In the 1930s, land and people were cleared to build the Red Hook Recreation Center, uh, one of many public swimming pools that were built during this period. And in 1939, the Red Hook houses were opened, um, one of the first federally funded housing complexes and the largest public housing complex in Brooklyn with a population of over 6,000 people, right? It's a very, very unique New York neighborhood that is a real mix of higher and lower income populations. 
Red Hook's isolation was and still is exacerbated by the lack of subway service to the neighborhood. You can see it's just an, an empty hole uh, there on the map. Um, it's only served today by the ferry and by buses. And, and this limited access to public transportation has meant limited economic opportunities for the lowest income residents. And, you know, frankly, to safely cross the incredibly busy traffic intersections here, residents must use pedestrian bridges or wait for a lot of traffic lights in order to get to the nearest subway station at Smith and Ninth Street, which, coincidentally is the highest station in the entire uh, subway system and it actually probably has some of the best views of lower Manhattan anywhere in the city. So why did they build this tunnel? Uh, what was its purpose? Even though the city undertook a huge expansion of public transportation beginning in the 1910s, the advent of the automobile, you know, the car had an enormous impact on its continued development and investment. As cars became cheaper to make, more people could afford them and more joined the already crowded streets of the city. By the 1920s, more cars and faster cars able to reach greater speed on their pneumatic tires caused danger and congestion on the crowded city streets. So expressways were planned to absorb this growth and to sort of really to foster uh, regional mobility. Not only that, but vehicular traffic on the East River bridges during the 1920s and 30s was really becoming untenable, as were the clogged local streets on either end. Something, you know, really just had to be done. In Brooklyn, officials were desperate for an automobile link to Manhattan to aid the sort of industrial and shipping companies on the Brooklyn waterfront with a direct path through to Manhattan, New Jersey, and then of course, New England and beyond. So it was very important to uh, the city, to, to the borough of Brooklyn. To try to deal with some of the issues being created by cars and traffic problems, plans were developed by a group of prominent business professional and civic leaders in the 1920s for the metropolitan region's future growth. The Regional Plan of New York and its environs, published in 1929, proposed an elaborate network of highways, railroads and parks, along with residential, commercial and industrial centers, as the foundation of the physical and social development of uh, the New York City metropolitan area. Now, one of the goals was to provide access to more of the region and increase options for living beyond the overcrowded core. By the time that considerations for a tunnel between Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn were getting serious, uh, Robert Moses, the gentleman you can see there on the screen, New York City's master planner, was already the chairman or president of seven public commissions and authorities, including the New York City Department of Parks and the Long Island State Park Commission. And without being elected by anyone, he was one of the most powerful men in New York. Moses added another to the list when he was appointed um, chief executive officer of the Triborough Bridge Authority by Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia in 1934, where he leveraged his leadership of the authority as well as the state and city positions he also held to expedite the project that had been underway for some time already. In the years after the Triborough Bridge opened in 1936, the authority built every major bridge for vehicular traffic within the city of New York. This is important to our story because in 1946, the Triborough Bridge Authority consolidated with the New York City Tunnel Authority to create the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, the TBTA, which was the entity that finished construction of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel um, by 1950. In 50 years, Robert Moses oversaw construction of bridges, tunnels, and 
416 miles of highways, essentially completing the arterial highway system envisioned by the Regional Plan Association in 1929. He also built 658 city playgrounds and 10 swimming pools in his role as New York City Parks Commissioner. The Verrazano Bridge, uh, which you can see in the image, was his last mega construction project, um, which was completed in 1964. Uh, but to get back to what we were talking about and the car. So as the car began to dominate the roads and public transportation was being expanded, there was also a building boom in the city. Downtown in the area surrounding um, Little Syria, bigger and taller office buildings were going up around them. And really many people expected that the small, rather rundown neighborhood of low rise buildings would be swallowed up by a property developer in the name of progress. Um, this was a desirable address being close to the financial district. And when the IRT 7th Avenue subway line arrived, which today is the number one line, um, had just a multitude of, of transit options for all the office workers, as we saw before. It seems that not too much thought was given to the poor residents of downtown when these articles uh, were written. Um, the New York Times pointed out that for those Syrians that couldn't afford to buy their buildings and secure their futures in some way, they would likely have to move to Brooklyn following many of their Washington, following many from their Washington Street home. Um, though lots of companies brought up the land and built around Little Syria, the neighborhood would survive for a few more years. Plans for a tunnel between Brooklyn and Manhattan, which had been kicking around since the 1920s, were approved finally in the late 1930s. Costs included $65 million for the tunnel itself, and then many millions more to take care of the roads and approaches on either side. Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia, a major proponent of this project, set up a public works authority so that it could borrow money from the Federal Public Works Administration. But in the end, and because the city was low on funds, because they were also at the same time constructing the Queen's Midtown Tunnel, he couldn't actually raise enough. Um, New York City had already benefited from federal dollars and New Deal projects, like the Triborough Bridge itself. Um, and so he had to turn to Robert Moses, head of the Triborough Bridge Authority for additional funds. Um, the TBA made millions in tolls that it could spend how it saw fit. Um, Moses agreed to use the Triborough Bridge Authority surpluses and raise more, but he exacted a price from LaGuardia. He would have to be put in charge of the tunnel authority as well. So according to Robert Caro, Moses's renowned uh, biographer, he said, to a man who valued power as highly as did LaGuardia, a price which would give Moses a monopoly over all new intracity water crossings, tunnels, as well as bridges, was outrageously steep. In his files can be found a memorandum from Moses giving details. Across it scrawled in huge letters in the mayor's handwriting, a single word, lousy. So the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority under Moses leadership was the entity that would uh, finish construction of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, but not before more drama ensued. Almost as soon as Moses got involved in the project in January 1939, he threw a wrench into the works and proposed a Brooklyn Battery Bridge instead of a tunnel. He argued vigorously that a bridge would be cheaper, quicker to construct, cheaper to maintain, high enough above the river to not interfere with water traffic and be able to host six lanes of traffic instead of four in the tunnel. He was able to get LaGuardia, who had no money to build the tunnel and really had no choice, and city officials, including the all-important planning commission to support the new bridge plan. At the same time, there was also immediate opposition. 
criticisms included the way a huge bridge would obscure the iconic views of Manhattan and its skyline, and that the proposed site was not a natural one for the bridge and its approaches in Manhattan would cause unjustifiable defacement and make impossible improvement of Battery Park. Opposed to the plan were many preservationists and reformers, including First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who wrote about the bridge plan in her um, syndicated newspaper column, My Day, on April the 5th, 1939. And this is what she wrote. To jump to an entirely different subject, I have a plea from a man who is deeply interested in Manhattan Island, particularly in the beauty of the approach from the ocean at Battery Park. He tells me that a New York official who is, without doubt, always efficient, is proposing a bridge 100 feet high at the river, which will go across to the Whitehall building over Battery Park. This, he says, will mean a screen of elevated roadways, pillars, etc. at that particular point. I haven't a question that this will be done in the name of progress and something undoubtedly needs to be done. But isn't there room for some consideration of the preservation of the few beautiful spots that still remain to us on an overcrowded island? After all, Lower Manhattan at Battery Park is one of the gateways through which many of us leave and enter our country. These moments are important moments in our lives and the irritation of an eyesore perpetrated in the name of progress will be bad for the souls of many Americans. Right on. So even though Moses had the support he needed from the city, in the end, it was a decision from Washington that put an end to the bridge. The federal government had to uh, give approval for the project to go ahead because there were war department facilities on Governor's Island and Treasury Department facilities at the Battery in Manhattan. The concern about the bridge being a target in the war and the potential impediment for shipping access to um, the Brooklyn Navy Yard were all reasons why uh, the bridge was rejected as a hazard to self-defense. So this project wouldn't be the last time that Moses went up against protesters and it wouldn't be the last time that he didn't get his own way. In the 1960s, in his fervor to cut efficient paths for vehicular traffic through Manhattan to connect with river crossings to the wider region. He wanted to build the Lower Manhattan Expressway and other elevated highways that would have destroyed communities throughout the densely populated island. Historic neighborhoods, you know, places like Soho that would have displaced many, many people. Impacted residents got together with activists like Jane Jacobs, who you can see there on the screen, to loudly protest these destructive roads. They and politicians like Ed Koch, um, at the time a city councilman, argued successfully that the kind of progress envisioned by Moses would destroy a vibrant way of life in the distinct urban environment of New York. I really love what Koch wrote in his letter to the Times. The city is for people, not cars. So they saw the value rather in investing in improved public transportation and promoting life happening on the streets. So these successful protests in the 1960s helped pave the way uh, for new thinking uh, about historic preservation in the city. Thank goodness. Once the bridge plan was nixed, ground was broken for the tunnel on October 28, 1940. Um, construction took 10 years to complete. Uh, war shortages halted the project for three years as supplies were diverted to that effort. Um, we hit, see here uh, the groundbreaking ceremony in action and some speaker notes um, from the occasion. So let me see if I can make this happen and we can listen to the come back here. And I shall never forget four years ago when thousands of school children in front of me repeated that splendid oath to the flag. When I come 
down in this part of New York as I have for well over a quarter of a century, I am reminded of the old prayer which says, fashion God, fashion into one happy people. The multitudes brought hither from many kindreds and tongues. For my friends, that is America. And every time, every time that I come back, I get just a little choky feeling, just something that grips my heart a little more. And so, let me say with you, God bless America. It's a good chest thumping. So the tunnel was completed in May 1950. It was the longest continuous underwater car tunnel in North America, and it still is, allowing over 50,000 cars a day to pass between South Brooklyn and Manhattan's fin financial district and beyond. Um, there are three prominent ventilation buildings, one at the Brooklyn Portal, one just off of Governor's Island, and one at the Manhattan portal, that's probably the most famous. Um, it, like all underwater tunnels, in my opinion, is an engineering marvel. Um, Ole Singstad was the chief engineer until 1946. Then um, Ralph Smiley became the chief engineer of the new TBTA, Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, and took over the project thereafter. Um, and they produced this lovely booklet to commemorate the opening, which included, you know, lots of great images and illustrations like the one we see um, here on the screen. Um, I'm going to try and also show you, oh, here we go, a brief video. It's got some quirky music, um, which uh, is uh, provided to us by uh, the MTA Bridges and Tunnels Special Archive, who um, we're very grateful to for providing and sharing so many of the amazing images and resources throughout the presentation uh, this evening. Um, and alongside is a list of some of the fascinating sort of facts around construction of the tunnel, but let's see if I can play this. what it looked like um, and the aerial shots are fantastic but there we are looking sort of through uh, battery park some of the adjacent building keeping transit moving ways because it's rather loud. Um, I love some of the um, numbers that you see, um, some, you know, just how many, 13,932 tons of structural steel, just like amazing um, statistics there. Um, one of the things that I think is fascinating is they have those big um, ventilation buildings um, and uh, 27 fresh air ventilation fans and look how much cubic feet uh, per minute of air that the tunnel exhausts it's just uh, sort of amazing as the tunnel was growing under the harbor let's look at what was happening um, above ground uh, as you can see from these two photos battery park was closed to the public and became a construction zone for the next 12 years 
Um, the New York Aquarium was closed, though, of course, it opened again decades later in Coney Island, right? Um, and the historic building it was housed in, um, a structure that actually Moses wanted to tear down, was saved. And we now know it as Castle Clinton. Um, it's the gateway, of course, to visiting um, both Liberty Island and Ellis Island. Um, transportation in the neighborhood began to change with the closing of the 6th Avenue elevated line in 1938 and then the 9th Avenue elevated line in 1940. The last horse cars to run in the city ended in 1917 um, and electric streetcars lost out to motor buses. Eventually, all the buildings on both Greenwich and Washington streets were raised from Battery Place up to Rector Street to make way for the ventilate, ventilation building on Battery Place and all the other sort of related roads and structures. Most of the rest of the vestiges of the neighborhood that survived the tunnel were demolished for the World Trade Center site just a, a few decades later. In the years following the groundbreaking, residents were unsure if and when they would have to move, if their building was slated for the wreckers ball or not. Businesses actually were still investing in this area right up to its demise. And it's actually kind of heartbreaking to hear their uncertainty as they really just were looking for answers from the authorities. Um, there's a, a couple of letters and I just wanted to read the handwritten letter. It's September 1945. This, uh, could you please tell me, do the people that live on Greenwich Street from Morris Street up, starting from 42, do we have to get out in December? The people said they were told they should look for a place from Battery Place. They are all upset. The reason I am asking you is because I have an old mother. She is very much upset. Could you please help me out? It would mean so much to my mother. Trusting to hear from you. Yours truly, Mary Krause, for Greenwich Street. Um, I want to um, thank the friends of the Lower West Side. Um, hello, I hope you're out there. Um, this is a group who are really trying hard to preserve the lost history of this neighborhood. And I'm sure they know much more than I do. Um, and I wanna thank them for sending us some really wonderful information about what happened to the many residents of Little Syria as the tunnel loomed ever closer. And, and there are a couple of examples of, of what they sent on the screen there. So once the war ended and the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority were formed and took over the project, the focus was once again on finishing construction. And in fact, by 1946, um, the residents and businesses that were still there were given final eviction notices and uh, properties seized by the city. So most people in, uh, you know, had been told to vacate by 1946. Uh, and by this time, a majority of the Syrian residents had already moved to Brooklyn, to the new heart of their community on Atlantic Avenue, um, which kind of just became a new little Syria. Um, as we previously learned, the ferries were integral to facilitating people being able to live in Brooklyn, but commute back to Manhattan. So. This journey, of course, only got easier over time, especially once the IRT, the Interborough Rapid Transit Company, bought their subway lines into Brooklyn, which um, started in 1908. Um, in a study by North Carolina State University, um, they found that by 1910, in fact, Brooklyn was uh, now represented the core of the Syrian community with new immigrants and young families adding to its number as the century progressed. At first families moved directly to the community in South Ferry, Brooklyn um, and the surrounding neighborhood in Brooklyn Heights. Some were setting up businesses and buying houses. Um, but as the Fourth Avenue subway opened in Brooklyn in 1915 and more lines followed, many um, from the Atlantic Avenue community began to spread out into other uh, Brooklyn neighborhoods. Um, journeying south, uh, particularly on the Fourth Avenue line, families settled in um, Sunset Park and Bay Ridge. 
the residential population of the Syrian colony in Manhattan began declining as Brooklyn became more and more popular. And though most businesses were still based in Manhattan, through the early 20th century, many businesses moved away from the colony uptown um, and business owners moved their residences to better conditions across the river. Some businesses that started in the Manhattan community flourished on Atlantic Avenue and are still thriving today. Uh, I'm very lucky because the museum is just around the corner. Sahadi's, for example, is a very famous food store that's been on Atlantic Avenue since 1948, having moved from Washington Street, uh, where the Sahadi's started their import business in 1898. Um, it's, of course, a neighborhood and a city favorite. Um, the Damascus Bakery is another business on Atlantic Avenue that opened um, back in 1930 and still makes some of the best baklava in the city and, in my opinion, some of the best bread um, really in the world. The Syrian American Directory Almanac of 1930 lists many diverse businesses in Brooklyn by this time, as you can see. Um, it also listed those in Manhattan as well as a residential directory. By the 1950s and 60s, Atlantic Avenue was said to be the Syrian shopping center of Brooklyn, Manhattan, and New Jersey. Today, of course, there are Arab Americans all over the city, but Bay Ridge, um, Brooklyn, has one of the largest and most established populations that's been growing since the 50s and 60s. It's directly connected to downtown Brooklyn by today's R subway line and the Rarely, uh, providing a key link to the older community on Atlantic Avenue. Strolling along Fifth Avenue in the northern part of Bay Ridge, um, you find stores, restaurants, catering, of course, to the local Arab community and beyond. Um, according to author Danish Meboob, writing for the New York City Lens blog, Arabic is spoken on the streets and in many of the restaurants and stores um, that stock lots of specialty products from Syria and Lebanon. Where once most of the immigrants were Christian, um, the Christian immigrants mostly settled in the southern part of Bay Ridge, um, the more prosperous part of Bay Ridge, actually, where they more easily assimilated um, to American culture. Um, but in this northern part of the neighborhood, they're mostly Muslim and uh, many folks who live there are quite recent immigrants to the United States. And many have been settled here and sort of many followed family. The Brooklyn Battery Tunnel opened on May the 25th, 1950, with a ceremony officiated by Mayor William O'Dwyer. On the same day, the portion of the Brooklyn Queens Expressway uh, from the tunnel north to Atlantic Avenue, so in Brooklyn, that also opened on the same day. Uh, the original toll in the tunnel was 35 cents, and you could make the trip from end to end in just three minutes, according to the Brooklyn Eagle, um, the 1,050 spot garage above the tunnel's northern portal in Manhattan opened a little more than a month after the tunnel opened. Um, and the first associated project to be completed was the Battery Park underpass. So again, on the Manhattan side, which opened in April, 1950. Two months later, officials opened a ramp on the Brooklyn side, which led from the southbound lanes to the northbound Brooklyn Queens Expressway. The Battery Park underpass was connected to the FDR Drive elevated viaduct and thus to the FDR Drive in May 1954. The Oh, excuse me, the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel project also entailed the restoration of Battery Park, which reopened in 1952, again, after a gigantic 12 year shutdown. So, you know, by the mid 50s, you've connected all of the pieces together. So buildings that once stood are gone. The rattle and screech of the elevated trains are silent since being torn down in the 40s. Victims of the war and the automobile and the clatter of hooves on cobblestones are not heard anymore. Rather than the quiet hum of the electric bus fleet amongst all the other vehicular traffic. Battery Park has undergone many changes since its renovation in the 50s, including a new South Ferry subway station 
um, which had to be constructed not once but twice after Superstorm Sandy in 1912, uh, in 1912, 2012, wreaked havoc on this part of Manhattan. It flooded, uh, of course, Battery Park and the subway station, and it filled the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel itself with approximately 86 million gallons of salt water. Um, Castle Clinton still stands and the park still provides respite for residents and tourists alike with some of the most wonderful views in the city and a really lovely urban farm. A modern style ventilation building that you can see in the photograph designed by Parks Department architect Amar Embry and made even more famous by the Men in Black movies stands where people once lived. The inscription commemorates the creation of the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority in 1946. Behind it, cars stream in and out along the roadways, heading north through Manhattan or in towards Brooklyn. Every year, the Stephen Siller Tunnel to Towers Foundation hosts a walk run to commemorate New York City firefighter um, Stephen Siller's run through the Battery Tunnel on September 11th. 2001, before he died at the World Trade Center site. The tunnel was renamed the Hugh L. Perry Tunnel in 2012 in honor of the former New York governor. Almost 60,000 cars use this underwater crossing, today paying around a $10 toll, I think, I haven't checked actually recently, um, if you're not an easy pass holder, um, which helps subsidize mass transit, especially the subway. Um, the system certainly would be hugely impacted if revenue sources like this went away. Little Syria itself endured. The people who made this community took stock of the options in front of them and like most immigrants, worked hard to make the best of their lives in America. Though not all residents were set up or even wanted to leave this downtown enclave, the Syrian community were able to take advantage of the public transit system to help them move across the river to better conditions in Brooklyn, which served them well as the Washington Street settlement waned and the inevitable development of this area consumed this little, little low-rise neighborhood. So I want to thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening um, and for joining me on uh, with this fascinating history. I, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Polly. That was great per usual, not surprised. Uh, we have gotten a few questions that I'll, I'll read out, but just a reminder, if you have a question for Polly, you can put it in the chat uh, and I'll try to get to as many as possible. I'll do my best. One thing, one question that came to mind when you're talking about Hurricane Sandy is that I feel like flooding in near Battery Park or has become more common recently. Have you read anything more recently about the tunnel and flooding issues or was it really? No. I haven't. And I mean, I think they've been working so hard um, on, you know, ways to stop that happening again. Um, there's just been such a massive focus on how to prevent the kind of damage that we suffered during Hurricane Sandy. So they have all the kinds of wonderful um, devices, um, but I don't know specifically too much about the battery tunnel. <clears throat> so one of the questions came to early looking at some of the photo captions and IDs and about our collection. Do you happen to know if the agency that took these did them intentionally because they knew it was going to be destroyed or was it a part of planning? Many of these, the, the images that I share this evening are from MTA Bridges and Tunnels Special Archive. Um, and I would imagine that the project was very closely photographed just like subway construction. Um, as soon as we planned for a subway, uh, we dispatched photographers to start photographing the city as it was being constructed. And I would imagine that the, these photographs were very intentional. Um, there were many aerial shots of the area um, so they employed lots of um, people to take photographs from airplanes. There are lots of services. Um, you'll see them annotated on the photographs, actually, who, who uh, were helping in this effort. But yes, they were very deliberate, I believe. OK. Um, also, when you were talking about Red Hook and that, you know, it's a transit desert, more or less, 
I know that someone mentioned, you know, didn't they have trolleys there? And I think there's still tracks, uh, but maybe those were, and they have buses that go there now. Yeah, yeah, they have had surface transportation, but in terms of what we would think of as rapid transportation, you know, and when we, when we think about rapid transportation, really we're thinking about elevated train lines and subway lines, rapid transit that, you know, has its own right of way, essentially. Um, yes, they did. They had streetcars. There are some that used to be parked in front of um, the fairway uh, supermarket in Red Hook. I'm not sure if they're still there. I haven't been to Red Hook in a, in a fair amount of time. But yes, I mean, Every neighborhood tra had transportation, but I think today Red Hook is probably worse off than it was even in the past. Um, buses are fine. Um, the ferry is fine, but most New Yorkers need access to the subway. Yeah, I once took a bus from near the museum to Red Hook and it took me over an hour. <laughs> I mean, probably could have walked, but I think maybe there's like delays that day, so I don't want to uh, suggest that it, that it isn't accessible. Anyway, okay, so one person asked, and I think it's like all of the things down there were called the battery because of the, uh, basically the battlements, the fort and a battery is a collection of cannons or whatever, I had to Google that. Uh, but I was curious uh, how projects are named or places are named in the city. Do you have any idea how the, why the tunnel was called that other than they were just I guess lazy because everything else was. Called. I, <laughs> I mean, I think it's a fairly obvious kind of a name. Um, it goes from Brooklyn to the Battery. Um, that it's. A, I agree. I think uh, place names are fascinating. And no, I mean, I'm not an expert. I have no. I don't really have an insight into how things get named. But yes, I mean, you're right. It was the battery for those reasons. Um, and I think the tunnel really was a very descriptive name. It really went from Brooklyn to the battery. Yeah. So sorry, that wasn't a very good answer. Just like, I know the answer, it's politics, right? <laughs> I guess, okay. Uh, so a couple questions about the construction. So do you know if there was any archaeological finds or considerations for the, the digging part of the tunnel? Or, I mean, I think just generally that's probably a part of construction now, or at least I would hope so. Um, Amy, I'm really sorry I got completely distracted because I did something with my cursor and sort of moved me out of presentation mode. So would you mind repeating that? Sure. It was about construction, <laughs> so sorry. Uh, someone asked about any kind of archaeological finds from the digging of Ooh. the tunnel. And I think that's something that's in place now as a, especially in a historic district like downtown Manhattan, but maybe it wasn't then. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know of any like anything that's come to the museum, for example. I don't think we have any sort of significant architectural finds. I know that when they dug, uh, South Ferry, when they built the new station in 2009, they certainly found some amazing things. They found a wall, they found lots and lots of sort of um, 17th century pottery and things like this. And actually they preserved um, some of what they had found and made it a part of um, the a subway station. Um, but for, for, for the actual battery tunnel, I don't know. I'm sure they did find interesting things. They must have, especially, especially underneath um, Battery Park. I mean, the city is just layers and layers and layers of people. So um, that stuff must have gotten left behind. So I'm sure they found things, but nothing that I know that, you know. Right. Super I mean, if you, I feel like I see all the time on social media, those images of what was actual land in that area. Yeah. Actually that's right I mean the battery yeah battery park at one point wasn't really attached to the city it wasn't a part of Manhattan all of that was filled in you know that was that was all landfill from projects like the subway okay great um and for people who are asking about the recording we always try to at least give a temporary link to those who registered if we can but it depends on the quality of the video and, and some other factors okay and then this is the last question about the presentation. Unless anyone has more, we can maybe do one or two more if there is anything out there. Um, do you have any idea where the dirt went? Did it become a part of something or? 
Gosh, great question. Again, I mean, you know, we've always sort of reused the stuff for landfill, but I'm not, I, I don't know specifically where the dirt went. That I, I would love to find that out. That's a great question. Yeah, I love the repurposing of stuff. Um, yeah. So I think that's a great question too. I'd be curious. All right, well, I'll wrap us up. If you want to stick around for just a couple minutes and I can tell you what's coming up on our schedule. I mean, so this is the conclusion of our first public program of 2024 and we have many more to come. There's a lot on our website. Uh, I also want to encourage you to visit the museum. Again, it's open Thursday to sun, uh, Sunday, 10 to four. You can find more details on our website. And I also put a link for membership. You can donate to the museum or to the or become a member to help support programs like these. And so upcoming programs, you can find it on our online calendar. I'm going to put that in the chat as well. And uh, in virtual program land, next Thursday at 6, we have a talk with Paul Grether, who is going to be talking about Grand Central Madison and its first year. And the Thursday after that, if you're a poly groupie like I am, you can see her again, who will be speaking on the story of Elizabeth Jennings Graham. It's the, I think, 170th anniversary of the event that ended up leading to the desegregation of, of a lot of transit in New York. Outside of virtual world, we have a lot of tickets left for, uh, or some tickets left for our Underground Subway 101 tour, where you can learn about the first companies of the subway and how the subway got started. And also our Second Avenue tour, which looks at the transit history and the art history of the Second Avenue uh, line. We also have a sketch and sit night at the museum where you'll learn from an artist who has had work displayed on in the MTA uh, and get some tips and then be able to sketch some things in the museum and hang out and maybe sip on some wine. And that's the end of March. And so we hope to see you at these programs. And thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hope to see you again soon. Good night.